from last time. I wouldn't have dared to do last time's lecture this time because about halfway through today, you're gonna be really depressed and unsatisfied and you're gonna feel a bit stupid because you've re received a, a, a series of slides that you can understand the words but you can't understand where the words came from. And it's just a bit frustrating. And then in the second half, I'll bring you back out of that deep despair and we'll, we'll talk about ha happy, optimistic stuff. But um, Marcus Hutter um, is kind of a unique person in, in this course. I, I've had a lot of sort of remote in interaction with famous people in this course. And a lot of them directly interacted with the students and really enjoyed it. They kind of got to know the individual students and they were stimulated by your questions and so on. Marcus Hutter was the opposite of that. He hated interacting with the students. He wanted me to get rid of every video evidence that it had ever happened. And it was just like a low point in his life. I'm, I'm not quite sure why. But um, part of it's probably a language thing. His first language is German rather than English. And he probably felt that, that, that it's not quite fair to be, be interrogated by all these glib English speakers. But he's unusual in another way in that whatever AI researcher you get to know, whatever person in computing science you get to know, they're never going to tell you that they're good friends <laughs> with him. They'll tell you he's an outsider. We don't really understand you know, where he's coming from. But on the other hand, he's a useful outsider because a lot of things, as you, some of you only learned about the technological singularity two days ago. And wouldn't you like to know more about it? What will it look like? What will it sound like? Nobody else will tell you that except Marcus Hutter. Everybody else will say, well, by definition, it can't be predicted. I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a thing of great, great uncertainty, so I can't tell you what it will sound like, what it will look like, nothing, you know? Whereas Marcus Hutter does, does tell you those things. And um, he, he has a very interesting take on it, I think. And the other thing is, you, if you just think about your brain against the world, right? You have a certain intellect. It's, it's not just like one number. You're good at some things, less good at other things. And you, you know, you have some strengths and weaknesses. And you've probably never before encountered a set of slides where the Dean of Science, <laughs> this is just the most intellectually difficult slide set I've ever encountered. And I don't know how the students are, are possibly going to cope with that. So that's what Jonathan Schaefer said when he looked at this Marcus Hutter um, slide set. I think that's sort of good for you. And you would also realize, I'm not going to test you on things I don't understand myself. And in here, there are things that I don't understand myself. For instance, the Library of Babel. I don't know if you've looked at this slide set yet, yet or you know that, but the idea that a library of all books would be completely worthless. It would have no information value. So remember that all books would be all misprinted books, all books with blank pages, all, you know, not just the, the correctly printed books, but all books would include everything, every book. And if you had a library that had every book, I think the idea is that it would not be searchable. You know, there, it has more variables than all the atoms in the world or something like that. And that's the reason that this library of uh, Babel would con contain no information. But I couldn't understand that. None of the other faculty could. And I talked to him on the phone. <laughs> 
Marcus Hunter got so frustrated with this dumb pathologist from Canada who couldn't even understand the, the Library of Babel slide, and he really didn't adequately explain it in a way that I could understand it. So, so I, so this is really the only time that this will happen to you in the course. But I think it is good because. <laughs> We talk a lot about machines smarter than we are, right? And what will that be like? Well, some of it will be probably like some of these Marcus Hutter slides today, where you can understand the words, but you cannot understand the logical leap to get to what those words say. And so that, that, that's, that's going to be part of what makes you unsatisfied with the talk that I'm going to give. So. We don't start with the Mar Marcus Hutter stuff yet, so this is kind of a normal lecture in the beginning. So the objectives, understand why one should not fear complexity. Do not seek the one great truth or many truths. They can be true concurrently. Understand three main schools of belief about the singularity. Understand the four main paths to the singularity. Understand the history of the singularity, Marcus Hutter's main ideas about it. Understand the challenge of promoting the singularity and the idea behind Future Day and Diversity Day. Some of you will be aware there used to be a Longevity Day. This is an opportunity maybe for some of you. Canada is just about the only country that has no longevity organization whatsoever. It seems to be an un-Canadian thing. Nobody in Canada is interested in you know, long longevity as an organized subject. But if you are, <laughs> you could become like the leader of Canadian longevity organizations. But anyway, that's the reason that we gave up on uh, Longevity Day. Do not fear complexity. There's beauty and complexity. The real world is complex. Your significant other, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, are they're complex. Part of the reasons that you like them are, you know, complex. It isn't that simplicity is beauty. There, there, there's also beauty in very complicated things, hard, hard to figure out things. You don't need to, to be put off by that. Seemingly contradictory ideas can all be true. You can find a balance between them. For instance, in my field, transplantation, the future of transplantation is a sort of hybrid of, of, of many different features. It's not just one thing. It's a decreased, uh, um, sorry, deceased donor donation, waiting list, tolerance, tissue engineering, repair, stem cell creation of new organs. It isn't that it's just one of those things. The future is all of those things. Some of those things are competing with each other for resources. Some of those things are strongly associated with fraud and intellectual dishonesty and stem cell tourism, you know, people following sports stars and, and uh, you know, celebrities to poorly documented clinics in the third world and stuff. It's very complicated, but that doesn't mean that somehow we can't conceptualize the whole thing. If you think about that idea of not just the binary, a world of binary choices, you have these dividing paths in, in your, you know, trajectory, right, left, yes, no, you know. The world isn't really like that. As Peter uh, Diamanda says, when faced with a choice between two desirable goals, choose both. It may not seem to you like that's possible, but it sometimes is. So this slide you've seen before. It is important to be able to describe the technological singularity in your own words. Uh, it is something that this course should allow you to know enough about that, that like parties in the evening and stuff, you're able to hold forth and, you know, talk about this. It's, and it, it is a very important subject because it affects the future of our species. What is going to happen when... Uh, the machines around us are considerably smarter than we are. What happens then? 
And part of the reason for taking this course is to help to increase the likelihood of a positive solution to that problem. So this is Moore's Law, price performance of computing. This is also one of the basic concepts of the course. This is an exponential curve. It's not linear. And it means that it, it's going faster and faster. And it predicts that um, computers will be as smart as individual humans in 2029. That's uh, uh, 11 years from now. And as, small, as smart as the whole aggregate human race in uh, 2045. And as I said last time, those dates may not be accurate, but it could occur sooner, it could occur later. Uh, but that, that's the prediction. Moore's Law is a bit muted in medicine uh, because medicine is heavily regulated. It's not motivated the same way. And so medicine's a little bit behind other uh, technology facets. Um, but there is a similar concept in, in medicine and really all other areas of human endeavor are uh, affected by this. So in medicine, regulatory oversight is often completely focused on compliance, discouraging risk-taking and innovation, doesn't have the same financial reward system Facebook isn't going to pay $1 billion for latest hot ticket item in imaging or medical informatics. And security always humps, trumps information sharing. And so better, faster linkages are constrained because of security concerns. And many of these are just theoretical concerns. They're, they're not actual practical concerns. So you might argue that medicine is over regulated, in other words, but a lot of the, the areas of science that we talk about in this course are actually not regulated at all. Like uh, nanotech, there is no regulation whatsoever. Uh, so is it just that a lot of morally good people go into nanotech, so we don't really need them <laughs> to be regulated? Not, not according to the people in the field. The, People in the field are kind of like a random sampling of n normal human beings. So they run the whole spectrum of good to bad, whatever you want to say. So there are many other fields like that that probably eventually need to be regulated the way medicine is. So I try to find metaphors in this course that are sort of universal, that, that, that refer to things that everybody knows about, hopefully. You're kind of familiar with the story of Alice in Wonderland, and you would understand that the world we're facing in the future is exactly the opposite of the world in Alice in Wonderland. The problem in Alice in Wonderland was the world was much more organic than expected. Everything was, a, was alive. The croquet mallet was alive, the croquet ball, every, Right? It was all moving, living, completely surrounded by biological things. The main difficulty Alice had was in managing her flamingo. So that, that was what was used as the croquet mallet. Um, we face exactly the opposite. In the technological singularity, we face a world that's much less organic than, than expected and could conceivably develop without us. So this idea that the future doesn't need us, it's one of the motivators for this course um, to, to, to kind of wrestle with that idea, to understand how humans could carve out a kind of permanent place in the future where they're not written out of the will somehow as uh, the years progress. <clears throat> So there are three main schools of belief about the singularity, accelerating change, event horizon, and intelligence explosion. And then within them, there are four main paths. 
can create an AI that exceeds human intelligence, build human computer interfaces that allow humans to go beyond their innate intelligence to a significant extent. That's called the cybernetic singularity. The third is find ways in biology to improve upon natural human intellect. It's probably the slowest and maybe the least likely to occur. Although in uh, CRISPR Cas9, you know, gene editing and so on, you can imagine that, that there could be some major break breakthrough there. And the fourth is where the internet comes alive. You wake up one morning and the internet starts talking to you and you realize that, that it knows everything about everything and it is, is like taking over. So uh, we build large computer networks with, where beyond human intelligence emerges. So in the last week or two, Ray uh, Kurzweil has done a video saying that these sorts of presentations always assume that like the machine that becomes alive is one big machine, but really what's more likely to happen is our cell phones that have more and more AI all the time, you know, it would be kind, kind of an aggregate thing <laughs> that suddenly, you know, you, you, you depend upon your phone, but you still feel like you're running your life. It isn't, right? It isn't making, it's helping you make decisions, but it's not making decisions yet. But that could change. And may, maybe that's the most likely way. So, it, so it's not something remote. It's something about as intimate and close to you as you can possibly imagine. The computing devices that you use every day, every hour, that's where this you know, emergence of smarter than human intellect could take place. <clears throat> All these different variations on belief in, in the singularity are reflected in the courses in Singularity University. Um, I took the nine-day executive course there. It's one of the very few academics to do that. Most of the people doing it were either people in, in the corporate world or, or government. There were government officials, people from the prime minister's office in uh, Israel and Argentina and stuff. So it was really interesting. I felt really like a fish out of water there. <laughs> That's kind of how, how this course came to be created. Um, so I, I became the only full-time university faculty member taking the Singularity University executive course. And I've been arguing for a new cross-disciplinary structure in universities to help prepare human beings for the future. And I talked about this as if I thought that someone else was going to do it, you know? And suddenly I realized, well, maybe since I work for a university and want this to go on in university, maybe I'm the person who should do this. So that, that's how the course began. So Bertolin Metzko, Metzko's course I, I talked about la last time, it's a little bit different from this. It seems more isolated, um, but it, it is somewhat similar to this. But I think now that I understand more about that course and, and the Bart's course in, in London, just sort of taking uh, Singularity University lectures and using them locally to, to create a course. So, so it doesn't really have its own faculty. It, it's using the Singularity University faculty. Eventually, it's our hope that there'll be hundreds of similar courses uh, in universities all over the world. So what you're doing 
taking this course now is a really unusual thing for a student to do, but you can imagine you are the prototype for students of the future, and you know at some point in, in the future, everybody will be taking courses learning about this content. Every morning when you wake up, you may subconsciously think about all the things you would like to have that you can never have, all the things you would like to do that you can never do. But you can imagine a future where neither one of those things are true, that the price of valuable things comes down to approximately zero. Virtual reality is better than real and can be shared with friends. And there's basically no barrier to having any experience you might want. Um, so that's called the post-scarcity world of abundance. It's, it's one outcome. And you can imagine the exact opposite of that, right? where everything goes wrong. There's a world much worse than today, where you're starving and unhappy all, all the time and so on. That is also possible. So there are you know, apocalyptic futures. And one of the things I'm kind of personally proud of, it's not exactly sports, but I, one of the future days, we, we had an, an, an evening event and I gave a lecture at 10 p.m. about this whole thing, you know, utopia, apocalypse, what are the possibilities? And it, it's, it's a pretty animated, uh, you know, entertaining lecture. It, it's not very pleasant to talk about the, you know, apocalyptic side, but one of the things that the focus groups told me is that I shouldn't hold back anything. Like, I said, should I like tell them everything or should I just tell them like the good stuff? So, so no, so, so they, they said that I should tell you everything. To, to the extent that it's possible, I should reveal the full spectrum of what possible outcomes are. I, I think in a way that motivates you more because if I could guarantee you that the, that the, the outcome was going to be positive and that the world was going to be a much better place than it is now, there'd be less reason to um, take, take the course. You know, it's like nothing, nothing to worry about. Let, let other people take care of it. So I don't feel that way. I, I think it, it cannot be guaranteed at all. Um, so, um, and in a post-scarcity world, what will medicine be like? Well, probably there won't be diseases as you know them in, in anymore. We will have gotten rid of them all. And so the emphasis of medicine then would be on human enhancement, not just physical, not just being able to be taller and stronger and run faster and think better, but moral, spiritual, every, every kind of, you know, improvement of human beings that you can imagine um, would be the emphasis of medicine. Are the doctors of today the best people to manage? <laughs> I'm really not sure. When, when we reach that point, we may need different skills. Like right now, the status of you know physicians is much higher than uh, social workers and stuff. We're we're talking about a future where a lot of the kinds of things that social workers deal with every day would be like you know the main issues. How can we make human beings better? How can we make society better? That would maybe be the challenge of medicine in the future. So Ray Kurzweil's views and intellectual exploration are as broad as the university he, he founded. So in a party in the evening when you hear somebody dissing him like, you know, he had this crazy guy with these na narrow views, it really isn't like that. His last few books are entirely generated by answering people's questions and, you know, criticism. So he, he wrote a book in 98, The Age of Spiritual Machines, 
look at the cover of it and you see yourself, a mirror image of yourself. It's kind of cool. Uh, and every book subsequent has been based on the reader and audience reaction to that first book. And so it's, it's not like he doesn't understand criticisms or he's never heard this new criticism that you would be bringing him. He probably has heard it before. He has more insights into it than you do, and he's reachable. You can actually write to him and, you know, he'll write back and so on. So it's, it, it's, uh, it's a situation where you can actually deal directly with the main thought leaders at the moment. And he walks around without, you know, bodyguards or anything like that. I, I found that interesting. When I met him for the first time, I'd, I'd been eating chips. My hand was just covered with this chip dust, you know. <laughs> but I was the only one wear, wearing a tux. It was like the premiere of his movie, and I thought you wear a tux for a premiere. But it depends upon, you know, the scale of, you know, the movie. If it's a major Hollywood movie, that, that's true. But a little bit lower, you, you don't wear a tux. So I was the only person wearing a tux. Okay, so now that, that's sort of been the, the, the easy part of the beginning of this lecture. This is the first uh, Marcus Hutter slide, the history. Um, in 1847, R. Thornton, the editor of Expounder of Primitive Christianity, that might not be a publication you've heard of before, wrote about the recent in invention of the four-function mechanical calculator, saying such machines by which the scholar may, by turning a crank, grind out the solution of a problem without the fatigue of mental application would, by its introduction into schools, do incalculable injury. But who knows that such machines, when brought to greater perfection, may not think of a plan to remedy, remedy all their own defects, and then grind out ideas beyond the ken of mortal minds. So that's like the first time that this idea of machine intelligence being beyond human was expressed. <clears throat> In 1863, four years after Darwin published On the Origin of the Species, Samuel Butler published a letter captioned, Darwin Among the Machines, compares human evolution to machine evolution, prophesizing half in jest that machines would eventually replace man in the supremacy of the earth. In the course of the ages, we shall find ourselves the inferior race. The letter raises many of the themes now being debated by proponents of the technological sing singularity. And then in Erewhon, which you'll all recognize as being nowhere spelled backwards, <laughs> Butler argues that there's no security against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness in the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now a mollusk has not much consciousness reflect upon the extraordinary advance which machines have made during the last few hundred years. Note how slowly the animal and vegetable kingdoms are advancing. The more highly organized machines are creatures not so much of yesterday as of the last five minutes, so to speak, in comparison with past time. So I, I sent you the link to Marcus Hutter uh, presenting these slides. And he, he has a paper called The Singularity Inside and Out, which talks about what the singularity will look like and sound like. He argues that will sound like white noise. If you're not within it, but sort of looking on from the outside, it's going to be like white noise. If you are within it, you won't notice anything because presumably your activities are speeded up the same as everybody else's and it would just seem like normal life. <clears throat> so um, this is kind of the history of the idea of the technological singularity. Um, 
these are some of the main figures who have brought up this possibility. Uh, Werner Vinge is a science fiction writer and still active today. Um, but Ray Kurzweil has really been the main person who has popularized the idea in his books in 1999, 2005, 2012. And uh, it's been life-changing for some people, like Jonathan White, who I, who I you know, required you to watch his TEDx talk. I think his wife got him this book. The singularity is, is near for Christmas and sort of everything was different <laughs> after that. So, um, so the, the, there are various events, uh, Singularity Summit uh, Organization, Singularity Univer University, Singularity Institute, and some famous uh, philosophers have gotten interested in this, including David Chalmers, and then I told you about Marcus Hutter. <clears throat> This is uh, Marcus Hutter's uh, depiction of, of Moore's Law. It's similar to the other curve that I showed you. Um, but with the I idea that this is the level of a single human brain and that um, machines will rapidly get beyond that level. Superintelligence by Moore's Law. Moore's Law computing doubles every 1.5 years, now valid for 50 years. As long as there's demand for more computing power, Moore's Law could continue to hold for many more decades before computronium is reached. Now, believe it or not, you need to know this word computronium, <laughs> not because it's so important, but it's just, it's been rather frustrating to me in the, fa in the past that somebody could take this course and not learn that word. So computronium simply m means turning the whole universe into computing. So, so it's a very simple concept. That's what computronium is, turning the universe into computers or computing. In 20 to 30 years, the raw computing power of a single computer will reach uh, 10, 15, 10, 16 flops per second, which is the same uh, as the human brain. Some conjecture that software will not lag far behind. And so we're likely to have human level AI in 20 to 30 years. <clears throat> And there are various phases. Uh, um, during during the, the hunter-gatherer Stone Age, um, um, the the time that it took for doubling was very long, and it's getting faster and faster. So, doubling in the Stone Age took two hundred and fifty thousand years. And then in the agricultural age took 900 years. Uh, industrial revolution took 15 years. Computer dominated age 1.5 years. That's where we are now. And you could imagine that, you know, eventually <coughs> takes a very short time. So it's sort of as you're waiting, it's, it's all doubling kind of thing. Doubling in a month, a week, a day. <clears throat> this is another way of looking at it, uh, epoch. Uh, epoch one is sort of physics and chemistry, and then biology, and then brains, technology, merger of technology, and then epoch six is the universe wakes up, so everything is, everything is computerized. Is the singularity negotiable? Can we uh, say that uh, we, we, we are not going to do this? <laughs> We're not going to allow this to happen, right? 
I don't r really think it is negotiable. Uh, you could imagine that one country might say that, but that would simply mean that other countries would move ahead faster and so on. Um, you can ma imagine that at some point in the future, we may have one single world government, but it's probably gonna be pretty benign and flexible if that hap happens. And it will probably come about because we haven't said no to this <laughs> rather than that would then be you know the entity that would say stop no we can't keep on going we must stop so there are two analogies he he draws one is to politics and to the inevitability of global warming i think those two are related because of the human factor right when i talk about what the world could be like with um, machines in charge, I think reversal of global warming is certainly possible. It doesn't seem to be possible for humans to do it. Just like the, the, the um, winding down of all conflicts between human groups is also not possible as far as I, I can tell for humans. But so, so the many other desirable changes in the world that presumably machines could bring about that we are not a, able to. And then analogy two is more complicated, but it ha has to do with a spaceship close to, to an event horizon might in principle escape a black hole, but is doomed in practice because it, it doesn't have the power to actually get away. So that, 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 that's another way to look at it, that, that we could resist, but we don't really have the power to be successful in resisting. So I think the singularity is going to happen. Um, just don't know exactly when. Uh, politically, it'd be very difficult to resist technology or market forces, D difficult to prevent uh, um, artificial general intelligence research, even more so to prevent the development of faster computers. Whether we are before, at, or beyond the point of no return is also philosophically intricate as it depends upon how much free will one attributes to people and society. If you look at our previous lectures, uh, there are some terms when we spend a lot of time talking about free will and others not, but I'm sure you're all you know, aware of it as a concept. <clears throat> okay, here's the Library of Babel. So if you don't understand this slide, I also don't believe that I understand it, and I did talk to Marcus <laughs> on the phone about it, and we, we, we didn't really come to a complete understanding except that he's not that interested in taking that many more phone calls from me, just like he's not interested in directly Skyping with you guys and looking you guys in the eye. That holds no appeal to him at all, whereas to David Pierce and a lot of very fine lectures, that's really exciting. Um, so <clears throat> what he's saying here, inside process resembles a radiating black hole observed from the outside maximally, Compressed information is indistinguishable from random noise. This, this idea of as you compress all the world's knowledge more and more, you reach something which is not searchable, you can't find anything in it, and so its information value is zero, as I understand it. Too much information collapses. A library containing all possible books has zero information content Maybe a society of increasing intelligence will become increasingly indistinguishable from noise when viewed from the outside. So even if that society is, is doing all sorts of tangible good things that make sense, you know, when viewed from the outside, it, it's just not going to be clear what's happening. So white noise does not assume that it's completely purposeless activity. It's just how it would look from the outside. <clears throat> Either way, outsiders cannot witness a true intelligence 
Singularity expansion could be inward or outward, usually fo follows the way of least resistance. Outward explosion will stop when all accessible convertible ma matter is used up. So you imagine turning the whole world into computing, but then you can also imagine within yourself turning every bit of your you know, biolog biological self into computing. Historically, mankind has always been outward exploring, just in recent times have become more inward exploring, miniaturization, virtual reality. So strict intelligence singularity is neither experienced by insiders nor by outsiders. Assume recording technology does not break down, then the singularity seems to be more interesting for outsiders than for insiders. The insiders wouldn't see anything. It just seems normal life, but they're accomplishing more, faster, and better than ever before. On the other hand, insiders actively live potential societal changes while outsiders only passively observe them. <clears throat> what is intelligence? <laughs> <laughs> this is sort of interesting. So there's 70 some definitions, but obviously Hutter thinks his is the best. So I, I'm in no position to judge this. There have been numerous attempts to define intelligence and uh, it's clearly not just speed. Uh, what will super intelligences actually do? Um, one of the first things you'll think about is re reproduction, but it turns out that the like you know bacteria are really good at that. So the, the, the <laughs> it probably isn't true that there's a direct correlate between reproduction and and uh, intellect. So mutation recombination selection increases intelligence if useful for survival and procreation. Animals higher intelligence via some correlated practical cognitive capacity increases the chance of survival and number of offspring, but that's not really true in humans. Um, intelligence is now positively correlated with power or economic, economic success, but actually negatively with the number of uh, offspring. Mimetics genetic evolution has been largely replaced by mimetic Evolution, the replication, variation, selection, and spreading of ideas causing cultural evolution. <clears throat> so what activities are intelligent? What activities does evolution select for? Self-preservation, self-replication, spreading, colonizing the universe, creating faster, better, higher intelligences, Learning as much as possible, understanding the universe, maximizing power over men and organizations, transformation of matter into computronium, maximum self-sufficiency, the search for the meaning of life. So what, you know, what should be our goals? And I think this is not just a random slide, right? That, that we're really in this course talking about a situation where neither you nor any of your friends or colleagues will be working in the usual sense. When you meet somebody and meet them for the first time, you're going to convey information about them and you, but it won't be what job you have or what job they have, because probably neither, both, both of you will have, you know, a, a, a life where all your needs are looked after but most of the so-called old-fashioned work is done by you know machines rather than people. So in that setting, what is the meaning of life? What makes you proud of yourself? You know, what 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 does your persona consist of? Um, it that's a very interesting kind of thought process that I'd like you all to go through in this course. <clears throat> Intelligence is not quite equal to rationality, reasoning towards a goal, maybe it is like that. More flexible notion, expected utility maximization, culmination of lifetime reward maximization. <laughs> but who provides the rewards and how? 
Animals, one can explain a lot of behavior as attempts to maximize rewards, but humans seem to have an astonishing flexibility choosing their goals and passions, especially during childhood. And robots, we can pick any reward system that we want. So, so I mean, we, we don't really have to assume any, anything. Still, the evolved biological goals and desires to survive, procreate, parent, spread, dominate, etc., are seldom disowned. <clears throat> what sets the goal for superintelligences and how? Anyway, ultimately, we will lose control. And the AGIs themselves will build further AGIs if they're motivated to do so. And this will gain its own dynamic. Some aspects of this might be independent of in initial goal structure and predictable. Evolving goals process assume that the initial virtual world is a society of cooperating and competing agents. There will be competition over limited, limited computational resources. Those vir virtuals that have the goal to acquire them will naturally become more successful in this endeavor compared to those with different goals. The successful virtuals will spread various ways and others perish. Evolving goals, the end result, soon their society will consist mainly of virtuals whose goal is to compete over resources. Hostility will be limited only if this is in the virtual's best interest. <laughs> that a terrible statement. <laughs> For instance, current society has replaced war mainly by economic competition since modern weaponry makes most wars a loss for both sides, while economic competition in most cases benefits is at least the better. What amount of resources are available? They will quickly be used up, become scarce. So in any world inhabited by multiple individuals, evolutionary or economic-like forces will breed virtuals. Goal to acquire as much computing resources as possible. Virtuals will like to fight over resources. Winners will enjoy it, while losers will hate it. In such evolutionary virtual worlds, the ability to survive and replicate is a key trait of intelligence. This is not a sufficient characterization of intelligence because bacteria are quite successful in this endeavor but are not very intelligent. <clears throat> Alternative societies, you might think of global collaboration with no hostile competition likely requires single powerful virtual world government and to give up individual privacy and to severely limit individual freedom sort of like anthills or beehives, and requires societal setup that can only produce conforming individuals. Might, not, might only be possible by severely limiting, limiting individuals' creativity, like a flock of sheep or school of fish. It's <laughs> not sounding like fun, right? So. <clears throat> Monistic virtual worlds, such well-regulated societies might better be viewed as a single organism or collective minds. So maybe the virtual world is inhabited from the outside by a single individual. Both virtual worlds could look quite different, be peaceful or dystopian, more peaceful or dystopian than the traditional ones. Intelligence would have to be defined quite differently in such virtual worlds. The adaptiveness of intelligence, maybe that's another important aspect. How flexible or adaptive an individual is. Deep Blue might be the best <coughs> chess player on Earth, but is unable to do anything else. On the contrary, higher animals and humans have remarkably broad capacities, can perform well in a wide range of environments. <coughs> Formal intelligence measure intelligence is the ability to achieve goals in a wide range of, of environments. This is Hutter's own definition. Informal definition implicitly captures most, not all, traits of rational intelligence, such as reasoning, creativity, etc. Has been regularly formulated in mathematical terms as non-anthropocentric. <laughs> not just human intelligence, wide-ranging, general, unbiased, fundamental, objective, complete, and universal. It's the most comprehensive formal definition of intelligence so far. 
<coughs> Copying modifying virtual structures will be very easy and low cost, cheap manipulation, experimentation, copy of virtual life is possible. Virtual explosion with life means uh, with life becoming much more diverse. In addition, virtual lives can be simulated in different speeds with speeders experiencing slower societal progress than laggards. Um, <coughs> designed uh, intelligences will fit economic niches. Current society already relies on specialists many years of training. So it's natural to go to the next step to ease this process by designing our descendants, such as designer babies. Another consequence would be that life becomes less valuable. Our society values life since life is a valuable commodity and expensive laborious to replace, produce, raise. We value our own life since evolution selects only organisms that value their life. Our human moral code mainly mimics this with cultural differences and some excesses. If life becomes cheap, motivation to value it will decline. Cheap machines decrease value of physical labor. Some expert knowledge is replaced by handwritten documents and printed books and finally electronic files. Each transition reduced the value of the same information. Digital computers made human computers obsolete. There were people who were called computers. It was their job to you know, compute things and their jobs became obsolete. In games, we value our own virtual life and that of our opponents less than real life because games can be reset and one can be resurrected. Consequence of cheap life, governments will stop paying my salary and they get the same research output from a digital version of me essentially for free and why not participate? Dangerous fun activity if in the worst case I have to activate just a backup copy of myself from yesterday. Just missed out on this one already not very well going day. The belief in immortality could alter behavior uh, drastically. The value of virtual life, countless implications, ethical, political, economic, medical, cultural, humanitarian, religious, and art, warfare, etc. Much of our society is driven by the fact that we highly value human individual life, if virtual life is or becomes cheap, these drives will ultimately vanish and be replaced by other goals. If AIs can be easily created, the value of an intelligent individual will become much lower, value of human life. So it may be ethically acceptable, freeze, duplicate, slow down, modify, when brain experiments or even kill oneself or others, AI at will, they are abundant and backups are available, just what we used, are used to doing with software. So laws preventing experimentation with intelligence for moral reasons may not emerge. So little value assigned to individual life, maybe it becomes a disposable. Are there universal values? Are there any universal values of quality we want to see that should survive? What do we mean by we, all humans, or the dominant species or government at the time? The question is asked, could it be diversity or friendly artificial intelligence? Could the long-term survival of at least one conscious species that appreciates its surrounding universe be a universal value? So that's, that's the end. <laughs> on Marcus Hutter's slides, and I know it's, it's kind of a, a downer and it's hard to understand part of it. But I still think it, it's, a, it's a good thing for you to, you'd have been through. There won't ever be another lecture like that in this course. So anyway, gonna raise your spirits now by talking about happy, fun things. But these also may be things that you actually don't find practical. That, you know, as I said, you may fall into the category of student only wants to do stuff related to this course between 2 and 3.20 on Tuesdays and Thursdays when school is in session and that's it. So if that's your circumstance, that's fine. But I, I just wanted to tell you we, we have a tradition of Future Day, which is March 1st, going back to 2012. This is uh, Joel Crichton. 
here. Uh, yeah, anyway, so, so uh, and that banner still uh, exists. Um, there were 16 celebrations in 2012. And as I said, you'd probably be predicting that by now there are thousands, you know, but actually now they're like two or three. So this is not, not an idea that's really caught on. But th those are the cities that celebrated Future Day in 2012. And I, I was just sort of one of the players. But interestingly, it always seemed to me the future day had to be fun. If it's going to be a new holiday, how would you get people interested in a holiday if it's not, not enjoyable, right? And it has to be enjoyable in all the ways that standard holidays are, right? It has to be pa pageantry and have, you know, memorable uh, visual things and smells and sounds and all, all that kind of thing. Nobody else seemed to catch on to that. They just had seminars, you know, let's talk about the future. <laughs> so I think in those cities that just had seminars, let's talk about the future. I think people the next year said, I, I don't want to do that again. I, I, I need to w wash my hair. I have something else scheduled for March 1st. And I'm terribly sorry, but I can't do it. So Julie Lin Wong, um, She's one of several people associated with this course who has a lot to do with, with space and NASA and so on. She is a 3D printing expert who has sent 3D printers to, to space and she's a you know, physician trying to figure out what kind of printed things you would need to stay uh, uh, healthy in space. Like if you fracture your thumb or something and need a splint you know, how, how could you use the onboard 3, 3D printer to create this? And you're familiar with the Paris Salon of, of uh, about 200 years ago. There was a period of time when all fervent intellectual activity seemed to be going on in Paris at the same time, and all the philosophers and artists and stuff we're getting together in this one identifiable place, which was a Paris salon. And what we, we, we all benefit from the creativity that emerged. And I thought, why can't we do the same thing in Edmonton? So best salon ever. And we, we thought of doing it at the art gallery. Um, I'm sure we'll do it some, some year, but we keep putting it off. We're not having an art gallery event in 2018. Maybe we will in 2019. I don't know. But part of it depends upon you also. If, if there were a lot of students and a student group that was excited about this and that really thought we, we could change the world with our combined creativity and be, you know, equivalent to Paris of the 1800s and stuff, then, you know, it, 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 it could be something unique, innovative, memorable. <clears throat> For this future day, I have kind of a practical need that, um, at, as you know, I'm sort of heavily embedded in, in the poetic community in Edmonton, as, as well as the musical community. But I'm aware that the poets I, I've been using for the future and all that jazz are not people who've like taken uh, biology in high school. Well, if you haven't taken bio in high school, it's kind of hard for you to conceptualize a lot of these high-end things that we're talking about, you know, regenerative medicine and so on. And it's true that, that, that you can compose poetry about things that you don't understand very well, most poetry about love, I mean, most of us don't understand love very well, but we're strongly motivated to write poetry about love, you know, but still, I think that what I need, I, I've identified sort of scientist poets, and I'd like to try them out. So, so, so one of the things I, I like to do on Future Day, wherever we do it and whatever we do, is to have some of these scientist poets that I've not made much use of yet, 
you know, perform and see what that's like and see if it isn't better than science related poetry put together by people who actually have ne never studied science, which doesn't seem to make much sense to me. So that's a, that, 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 that's a very simplistic thing. So that's a very lower level goal that I've had before. Now, before we've done big things like, you know, the, the, uh, the high level bridge has these lights now and you may think it's difficult for you as an individual to influence what color and pattern the lights are at night, but it's not difficult because that program is not very popular and people who are behind causes are not very much into <laughs> having those causes identified and lighting on the high level bridge. So, you know, we, we, we were able to change the lighting on the high, high level bridge for future day in a past year, but also I don't know that anybody noticed who the heck cares, you know, when you're driving across the bridge, do you really care what color it is? And are you looking at that sign that tells who sponsored the color of the night? You know, you're probably thinking about your own stuff. So, so we, we, we've done a lot of exciting things like that in, in the past, and I'm willing to do high level, high impact things that you might think about if you want to this year, but I'll also we can just kind of coast and I'll try out my scientist poets and that'll sort of be it. So it's, so it's, so it's kind of up to you. What, what level do you want to you know, aspire? And uh, we, we are going to do Future Day. Most of, of the cities that did it in 2012 are not going to do Future Day. So just by do, <laughs> doing it, we're like, you know, ahead of the cities that gave up on it a long time ago. Um, you don't have to decide about that today, but it's an example of something I strongly believe in, mute, mature, youthful decision making. So that's what would be going on in your making this decision about Future Day. <coughs> So we, we have used the uh, analogy with Big Bang Theory, which you know, is the most popular TV program in Canada and very popular throughout the world. And so it seems like the subject matter is very similar to the subject of this course. Uh, there, there are even individual episodes where they talk exactly about things that, that we talk, but it's humorous, right? <laughs> it isn't like serious. Um, but you would think that we should be able to reach as many people as they reach. So that's, that's one goal. Then if, if we're going to have a new holiday, it needs to be visually arresting. So many of you are, are familiar. In the Asian subcontinent, there's the holy festival where you sprinkle pigments on each other, it began with natural pigments, which are non-toxic, but a lot of colors, it's hard to find them naturally. It's really easy to find in paints, but the paints are toxic and create all sorts of interesting medical diseases. So there's a whole medical side of, of um, the holy festival business. And then there's uh, Color Me Rad, which you've probably all heard about for various things, which is kind of like the way it plays out here. So it wouldn't be that unique. If we did something like uh, Color Me Rad on Future Day, people would already have done that for something else. So it's not, not like, yeah. This is what it looks like. And it's a much happier looking crowd, if you imagine that the, the, those are non-toxic clouds, but I think they're actually probably toxic clouds, giving you lung disease and skin disease and all sorts of things. <clears throat> okay, and then uh, poetry. This, uh, those of you who are on Facebook and access my Facebook page may be aware the only poetry on my Facebook page that I didn't write myself is this poem. 
It's called Crayola Bomb. Maybe we should develop a Crayola Bomb as our next secret weapon, a happiness weapon, a beauty bomb. Every time a crisis developed, we would launch one, would explode high in the air, explode softly, and send thousand millions of little parachutes into the air, floating down to earth boxes of Crayola. And we wouldn't go cheap either. Boxes of 64, the sharpener built right in silver and gold and copper and magenta and peach and lime and amber and umber and all the rest. And the people would smile and get a funny look on their faces and cover the world with imagination. So, and if that doesn't do it for you, that this is the way a time-lapse picture of your Roomba ro robotic vacuum cleaner looks. If that doesn't do it for you, you can get very colorful displays of hot air balloons, but then they, they can uh, contact high tension wires and <laughs> you know, it's, it's not entirely without, without risk. If there's gonna be a song associated, maybe it'd be this one, windmills of your mind round like the circle and the spiral, like the wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever spinning reel like a snowball down a mountain or a carnival balloon like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon. A clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face in the world is like an apple whirling silently in space like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. This is the high level bridge, the way we colored it in 2015. Uh, yeah, remember that um, the future includes not just stopping aging, but potentially reversing aging. Post-scarcity world, your suggestions are welcomed. So, uh, we have 11 minutes left. Any questions or comments? How, how is the course thus far? Do you feel deeply dejected now? <laughs> is, it, is it okay? This is, the, the first half of this lecture today was honestly as, as bad as it gets, whatever degree of frustration or, you know, uh, pain you, you were feeling, that, that it doesn't really get worse than that, that in subsequent lectures. Yeah? So, we were talking about the different people that talk about AIs and stuff, right? Right. And there was this part about virtual politics. So, politics is a lot of decision making and people in power have that autonomy. If AIs are the ones running politics, would they have that, like, at times it feels like AIs would be like a commodity, we'd be using them to get rid of the problems that we can't solve ourselves. Right. And then would they have that autonomy or decision making power to say no or like... I think this, this whole um, meta level structure Thing hasn't been worked out, and you, you you could be one of the people you know conceptualizing that. It isn't just how is it going to be. We're not passive victims of the future. We can actually help shape the future. You know, if if, if you describe a better structure for the way humans and computers should interact than anybody else has described, maybe people would do it your way, right? So so yeah. I, I would say it has not been determined. And people who just say, well, you know, we would be creating these computers, so obviously they would work for us, and they would just do, they, they, there's no question that they would be able to replicate and improve themselves. So it's true that w originally humans would create them, but they would get better in ways we could not understand that's what you know machine learning today is that um, even if you require the machine that's doing machine learning to explain everything in terms that humans can uh, understand machine itself won't be able to <laughs> explain everything because the words don't exist right so I mean it, it will explain part of it 
that it's able to put into words, but the part it can't, it, it's not that it's like hiding things, it's that not only do we not have the understanding to understand some of what it will be doing, but we probably don't have the words to kind of you know, describe the concepts. So right now there's a lot of kind of black box stuff where machines are solving problems in ways that we don't quite understand how they did that. Even things you use every day. How did speech recognition get as good as it is today? And are there human beings that understand every single step? No, I, d I don't think so. They can tell you, you know, 10 years ago when it was really crappy and when you made a phone call and got an automated attendant, your heart sank because you know, knew it was gonna get screwed up and you know, it was completely unsatisfying. How did the very satisfying experience come about today? A lot of it is this kind of black box thing where uh, machine intelligence is getting better and better at understanding human speech and when somebody says something what they actually want and, and so, so on. But we don't know exactly how. Um, so it, it isn't that we, we will, we're in control now and we'll always be in, in control so is really n no issue. It's, it, it's almost the opposite. That, the AI things that you like the best are guaranteed to be the ones where you can't just write down the algorithm and you look at it and say, oh, so that's how it works, great. Yeah, no, you, you would probably not be able to understand any of the, the uh, algorithms behind the things in your own life that are using AI. Uh, yeah, so. Babel library that there'll be information and things there but you won't really have like the knowledge to understand it yourself I don't think that's what he meant at all. I kept trying to simplify things like that, you know. Do you mean? He said, no! <laughs> oh no. No, I don't think it's it's that. I, I think it's, it's something simpler that um, we think that having more of something, is, if that something's good, is always good to have more of something good, right? But he, he's saying that with something as valuable as, a, as uh, information, if you have it all and put it all in one place, you will not be able to get any useful information out of that. I think that's what, what he's saying. And that's different from being able to understand it. It's probably also true what you're saying, that if we, if we could get the information out, we'd be saying, huh, we don't understand it, right? But, yeah. So I, I think both are true. I, I think what you're describing is a very real and important problem of us not being able to understand how you know, machines are doing some of the important things that they're doing today. But it's a different problem from what he was talking about on that slide, and I don't fully understand it. So that's, yeah. Are there other questions? Are you, are, are you feeling like this is valuable in your life, or this is so far removed from anything you're trying to do at the moment? <laughs> it's like, I, I think what one can argue is that it is, uh, this is kind of a course before its time, right? That, 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 you know, most people would not understand the reason for taking a, a course like this. That doesn't mean that in the future there won't be courses like this everywhere and it won't be a required course because everybody needs to know this stuff. Just same as, you know, when quantum mechanics was new, you know, everybody was just treat, teaching traditional physics and the quantum stuff seemed really spooky and weird and so on. So this is sort of similar to this. This is, uh, you know, evolution beyond where most people are thinking. And, and I, I think it's, it's, it's bound to be valuable for you in some way. 
Um, are there other questions? Okay, so um, yeah, we've got uh, three minutes left. Next time is going to be Gary Goldsand talking about um, ethics. So just think of what, what I've been talking about up until now and the fact that, um, you know, there are ethical implications <laughs> about virtually, virtually every slide and, you know, matter of human rights, you know, not just human, but animal rights, machine rights, you know, the, 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 there are a myriad of uh, questions here. And <clears throat> I think we're fortunate to have Gary Goldsand in this course in that um, it's possible to ask, answer every ethical question with, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, well, consider this and consider an absolutely balanced answer <laughs> that really doesn't convey any information. Like, I asked you for a reason. I wanted an answer. You just <laughs> given the darn question to me. So he, he's uh, probably the most, you know, articulate uh, ethicist that I've met. And I think you'll like that. You'll, you'll get tangible ideas to, to, to kind of structure your, your ethical thinking around. And then after him, um, you get three lectures on uh, AI. And, and uh, so the, the uh, Osmer Zion lectures are a little different every year, but they tend to be somewhat similar. So you, you can look at previous years and see what you're going to get there. I, I can't predict what uh, Gary Goldsand is going to do, which is kind of nice. <laughs> so, so, anyway, so, I, so I really don't know how he's going to start or what his thrust will be on next Tuesday. Um, I also don't know if we'll have uh, visitors on that day. We might. I, I, I have people who have come to see me. I just don't know how appealing it's going to, going to be for them to come to that lecture, but they might. Okay, anything else or a, a, any questions or problems? Okay, then I will 